Tom's Midnight Garden, side four. To whomever may find this, these skates are the property of Harriet Melbourne, but she leaves them in this place in fulfilment of a promise she once made. You'll have to finish your drawing tomorrow, Tom. It's time for bed now. <sighs> All right. I'll come in and say good night in a few minutes. He's always very good about going to bed. Yes. He's a funny boy. All he ever draws are clocks. However much time I spend in the garden, I don't spend a single second of ordinary time. That's what the clock means when it strikes 13. The hours after the 12th don't exist in ordinary time. So I can go in the garden tonight and stay for months, and time here will stand still at Thursday night and wait for me. Then I can go again on Friday night and stay even longer. I've come to put your light out, Tom, dear. I must finish my letter to Peter. It's time for sleep now. The letter can't be posted until tomorrow anyway. But I didn't send a letter yesterday either. Never mind. I promise to write every day. It's not good to break a promise, but luckily it won't matter to Peter. He'll be seeing you the day after tomorrow anyway. Good night. <sighs> Sorry, Pete. Peter? Why is your light still on? It's late. I can't sleep. I didn't get my letter from Tom today. He'll be home very soon. Don't you worry about it. Now close your eyes and you'll soon be asleep. How can I sleep when I haven't got stories of the garden to think about? I haven't even got any letters. I had to burn them all. All I've got is the postcard of Ely Cathedral. Peter, I'm sorry I didn't write you today. I will write tomorrow. <clears throat> then I'll be able to tell you if I can really skate on Hattie's skates. Tom? Hattie, I thought you'd be out in the garden. I wasn't sure if it was you or a shadow. Oh, of course it's me. Is it still winter? <sighs> yes, it is. James will be down in a minute. It's his turn to drive into market in Castleford, and he's taking me in the trap with him. He doesn't know that I mean to skate this afternoon. I mean to skate from Castleford right down to Ely. Can you? Well, of course, it really isn't quite ladylike, so I mustn't tell anyone. Look, I have my skates hidden in my muff. It's the same skates. Uh, but I meant, is the river really frozen over? Frozen so hard. Abel's grandfather says this is one of the hardest, longest frosts he's ever known. The river here is too near the source for the ice to be safe. But below Castleford, and all through the fens... Tom, come with me. You will, won't you? That's why you brought your skates. Now? Without going into the garden at all? Oh, the garden will always be there. But this great frost... Well, Cousin Hattie, are you ready? Yes, James. I'm ready. Whoa! Whoa! It's very busy! It always is on market day. You should come into town more often, Hattie. Yes. Uh, this will do. I'd like to get out here, please, James. Do you want to lift back later? Oh, thank you, James, but... Oh, I don't quite know when I shall be ready to return. Well, there's always the train, though it's something of a walk from the station to the house. <laughs> I shall be all right. Do you know the train time? Yes! Don't fuss. Goodbye, James. Hot breffles. Enjoy the shops. I've never ridden behind a horse before. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Come on, Tom. The river's this way. 
It's a very new fashion. Oh, there's a policeman. <laughs> I've never seen a policeman on skates before. He looks like a navy blue duck. <laughs> <laughs> there are some very good skaters here. But I don't expect any are going as far as we are. <laughs> and it really is safe. Oh, yes. This frost is all over England. On some waters, oxen have been roasted whole. Do you know, on the Cherwell at Oxford, a coach with six horses was driven down the middle of the frozen river. The truest and greatest and best use of ice is skating. There. Are you ready? I'm ready. <sighs> We'd better not skate with linked hands as others do with their partners. I think it would look strange as one of us is invisible. <laughs> <laughs> I can skate as well as you. You're keeping up. That's good. It must be because I have your skates. We've left most people behind now. Not many will skate as far as we will. Oh, look, Tom. The Tower of Ely Cathedral. Oh, we've done it. Oh, not yet. There's still a long way away. Shall we go to the cathedral when we get there? Oh, yes. And can we climb the tower? <laughs> I expect so. Yes. <laughs> to people who have died. Uh, Mr. Robinson, gentleman of the city, exchanged time for eternity on the 15th day of October, 1812. Exchange time for eternity. Hattie, that's the doorway to the tower. Can we go up? I'll ask. to go to the top of the tower? We are about to make the last descent of the day, young lady. Uh, the charge is sixpence. Come on, Tom. We are to climb the stairs now. Peter, I'm climbing the tower at last. There are so many steps. I've counted to 273 already. And there are more to come. Uh, after you, young lady. 274, 275, 76, 177, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, 176, One, eighty-two, eighty-three, eighty-four, eighty-five, eighty-six. Oh, we're there. Oh, Tom, we're so high up. I can see forever. There is the River Ouse, and in that direction you may see the spires of Castleford. The sunset on the ice the makes it look like you fire. You follow me. You can get some better. This way, Tom. Tom, Tom, who's that? Peter, how did you get here? But Tom, where are we? Where's the garden? I thought you'd be with Hattie in the garden. Oh, the garden's back there, but Hattie's here. Where? I can't see her. Oh, there, on the other side of the tower, the one carrying skates. 
But that's not Hattie. Right, go down that's again, a grown-up woman. Please, ladies and gentlemen. I don't understand. She can't be Hattie. She's grown up. She's grown up. She's grown up. She's grown up. Peter, don't fade away. Stay here. Peter! Tom? Who was he? What was he? He was like you. And he was unreal looking like you. It, it, it was my brother Peter. But he is real, Hattie. And I'm real too. And you really are grown up. <clears throat> Come along, young lady. Don't you want to go home tonight? Uh, yes, it's late. We must hurry. We? It's you should hurry. I've been waiting for you. Come along. Oh, I can't fasten my skates for hurrying. We must get back. Yes, I must get back. Where are you skating to, young lady? This time of evening. Castle Fed. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. Happy ice holes. Now this old southwest wind means rain and thaw lately. There's already someone went through the ice up towards Castleford. Friends got him out just in time. <laughs> you best do my time. Thank you, but I shall skate. Tom, I haven't enough money to take the train. Be careful. The ice will be weak on the bridges and along the reed beds. <laughs> Come on, Tom. Let's go. Uh, at least you have a full moon. Take my hand. Where are you off to this time of the evening? I'm skating home. Oh, you shouldn't be skating alone. Especially not on this thin ice. The horse and gig is waiting just through the trees. See the light from the lamps? Well, please allow me to give you a lift. Thank you, Barty. kind of you, Barty, but I'm afraid I'm taking you out of your way. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I've noticed lately that you skate as well as your cousin James. Oh, thank you. Few ladies have skated so far as you did today. Oh, Barty, I love it so. Hattie, can we go back in the garden when we get... My own mother once skated from Castleford to Ely and beyond, but she was in the company of my father. I had heard there were other great frosts in the past. A thaw's beginning tonight, but they say it'll freeze again. Before the end of winter. Hattie, I'm oh, I do hope you. you will, Barty. Perhaps next time you go to Ely, we can make up a party for the adventure. Oh, yes. Hattie, you're looking right through me. Alan, the flat door is open. What? It's wet with one of Tom's slippers. Is he not in his room? I shall have a word about this. Um, no. You must have been sleepwalking. We mustn't startle him. Let me... <sighs> yes, all right. Tom, dear? Time to wake up? No. Oh, no, not this time. I don't want it to be now. Tom? You're safe. Have you been in a nightmare? It's all right. It's over now. Perhaps it's because I went to sleep in the gig. You're still half asleep. Here we are on Friday morning and tomorrow you're going home. We'll go shopping today and you can choose some little presents for your mother and father and Peter. That'll be nice, won't it? Yes, all right. Tonight is my last chance. You didn't strike 13, but I've come anyway. It has to work tonight. It's my last chance. You understand, don't you? I want to exchange my time for an eternity of Hattie's. Time in the garden can go back. She may be a little girl again tonight and we can play. It's 
so dark tonight, but I know the garden well enough. No! I want the garden! Hattie! Hattie! He was in the backyard. He must have woken the whole house. Put him on the bed. <clears throat> I'll sit with him until he calms down. <sighs> he had this ancient pair of skates with him. They don't look as if they've been used for, well, 50 or 100 years. Where can he have got them? Alan, you mustn't question him, not even in the morning. Well, I'd like to know. You promise me he's not fit enough to be worried. <sighs> ah, you may be right. Oh, I'd better put them with his things to go home tomorrow. When he called out, it sounded from up here as though he called someone's name. No, I don't think so. I think he just screamed. Oh, I must go and explain to the other tenants. Reassure them there's no cause for alarm. <laughs> Tom, dear, you can't go home today by train in this state. Now, who is that? So, Tom, your uncle is going to drive you. All right. Tom, can you tell me what the matter is? You wouldn't believe me. I'm sure I should if you told me the truth. Please, Tom, try. It's the garden. I've lost it. Tom? It's too complicated. That was old Mrs. Bartholomew again. She was very agitated last night when I went up to apologise for the disturbance. Thought I'd succeeded in calming her, but it seems not. <sighs> Why can't she let well enough alone? What does she want just now? Well, she's still insisting that Tom go to her and apologise himself. I shouldn't dream of sending him. Well, certainly not. I told her as much. <laughs> she need not think she could intimidate me. I'll go. I shan't let you, Tom. No, Tom. I shall go upstairs again myself and take your apologies for you. I'll go. I expect I ought to. I don't mind. <laughs> Yes? I've come to say I'm sorry. Your name's Tom, isn't it? Your uncle mentioned it. What's your other name? Long. I've come to apologise. Tom Long. So you are a real flesh and blood boy, the Kitson's nephew. And in the middle of last night, you screamed out. You woke me. I said I'm sorry. I can hardly believe you're really here. Don't you understand? Don't you know who I am? You're Mrs. Bartholomew. You called to me last night. You called my name. Come in, Tom. I should go downstairs. My uncle's driving me home. Come in. Come inside. Isn't that the barometer from the Melbourne's Hall? Come into the sitting room. I'll show you something. Look, look at the photograph over the mantelpiece. That's young Barty. Yes, a likeness taken soon after we were married. Young Barty was Mr. Bartholomew. That's right. You married young Barty. Who were you? I've been telling you, I'm Hattie. No, no, Hattie was alive when Queen Victoria reigned. I worked it out. That's right. I was born towards the end of the Queen's reign. She was an old lady when I was a girl. I'm a late Victorian. I don't understand. The garden's gone, and yet the barometer's here, and the clock is still in the hall. And now you say you were Hattie. What happened after the day I skated at Ely with Hattie, the last time we saw each other? That wasn't the last time I saw you. I see you don't know all of our story. It was in 1895 that you and I skated all the way to Ealing, the year of the famous Great Frost. That evening, on the way home, when it was getting dark and the ice was becoming treacherous, we met Barty. Do you remember? Yes, I remember that. And Barty drove us back. Hattie talked to him all the time. She took no notice of me. You were getting thinner, thinner through. 
every winter that I saw you. During the drive home, you faded, and by the time we got back into the house, you'd vanished altogether. Shall I tell you a secret, Tom? Yes. Barty and I knew then that we wanted to marry, though, of course, nothing was said until much later. I might have told you the secret all those years ago, Tom, but I never had the chance to speak to you again. <laughs> you were Hattie. You are Hattie. Harriet Melbourne. <laughs> now Harriet Bartholomew. You weren't a ghost. Oh, Hattie. <laughs> yes, Tom. Can you imagine how pleased Aunt Melbourne was when I accepted Barty's proposal? <laughs> she was horrible. She was delighted to get me off her hands. I was married on Midsummer Day, a year or so after the Great Frost. The night before my wedding, when I was packing, I remembered the promise I made to you about my skates. I wrote a note of explanation and left it with the skates in my secret hiding place. I found it. I found them. Those were the skates I used to go to Ely. So we were both skating on the same skates. <laughs> Fancy. Oh, Tom, I remember a terrible storm the night before my wedding. I couldn't sleep. I looked out of my window and thought of all I would be leaving behind me, and of my childhood, and the time I'd spent with you. And that was the last time I saw you, down there in the garden. You were as thin through as a piece of moonshine. When? I never saw you looking out of a window. You didn't look up. You were wearing your pyjamas as you always did. Yes, I never bothered to stop and dress. In those days, most boys wore nightshirts. I didn't know about pyjamas. You seemed to go indoors, and I thought, he's gone. But the garden will always be there. It will never change. And then, do you remember the tall fir tree? When the storm was at its worst, the lightning struck it. I remember. Oh, Tom, it was so terrible to see the lightning struck and it fell. I heard you call out. That was when I knew the garden was changing all the time. Because nothing stands still, except in our memory. No, it's all different now. It is. But I forgot the tree and the garden. And I forgot you too, because it was my wedding day. Barty and I went to live on one of his father's farms in the Fens. We were very happy. So when did you come back to this house? Not for a long time. When Aunt Melbourne died, then the family business began to fail and James sold off the house. Barty bought the house and some of the furniture for me, especially the grandfather clock. When I was a child, I loved to hear it striking. I loved the way it chimed, whichever hour it chose. I still do. So do I. And then you moved in here? Not then. No. Barty said it was not a gentleman's house with no garden, so he made it into flats and let them. But you couldn't take the grandfather clock away, could you? It couldn't be moved. That's right. It remained here. Barty and I had two sons, both killed in the Great War. Oh, Hattie. It's all right, Tom. I did all my crying for them a long time ago. Then, many years later, Barty died, and I was left alone. That's when I came to live here. And since you've come to live here, you've often gone back in time, into the past. When you are my age, Tom, you live in the past a great deal. You remember it. You dream of it. That's why the weather in the garden was usually so perfect. And why time sometimes jumped ahead and then sometimes went backwards. It all depended on your dreams. But Tom, never before this summer have I dreamed of the garden so often. And never before have I remembered so clearly what it felt like to be little Hattie and to be longing and longing for someone to play with. And I was longing for someone to play with too. That must be how it worked. That must be why we were able to go together to the same garden. But these last few nights, before last night, you've been dreaming of winter and skating. Yes, of skating to Ely, the furthest I'd ever been from my home, and of growing up, and of Barty, and my life with him, 
I dreamed less and less of you in the garden. I suppose you couldn't help it if you were growing up. And last night? Last night, I dreamed of my wedding and of going away to live in the fens. So last night, when I opened the door, the garden wasn't there anymore. That's why I screamed out. I called to you, but I never thought you could hear me. I knew it was Tom calling for help, but I didn't understand then. I didn't believe you were real until I saw you at my door just now. We're both real, then and now. It's as the angel said, time, time no, no longer. longer. That means it's eleven. Your aunt and uncle must be wondering what has become of you. Go and ask them if you may stay for a morning cup of tea and perhaps a piece of seed cake. Yes, Tom, you may stay a little longer with Mrs. Bartholomew, but are you sure you want to? Yes, I do, please. And you're sure you're not being a nuisance to her? I'm quite sure. Hattie, Mrs. Bartholomew invited me. Oh, dear. You certainly seem a lot better now. But do be back by 12 o'clock. We'll have an early lunch before Uncle Alan takes you home. I have a confession to make, Tom. You told me not to carve on tree trunks, but after you taught me to swarm Trixie, I carved both our marks there, a long, thin cat for you, wearing a hat for me. It did look ridiculous. I never told you. I once planned to climb the yard fence to look at Trixie. I wonder if I'd found your drawing. It may still show. There, on the trunk. H-M. That means Hattie Melbourne has climbed this tree. I've carved my initials on all the yew trees, except Trixie, of course. What happened to Abel? He married Susan, and they had a big family. They were very happy. Abel was the only person in the garden who could see me, <laughs> apart from you. Fancy. Aunt Melbourne was always so scornful of Abel. She said he was as stupid as the geese. <laughs> well, the geese could see me, and she couldn't. And the dog saw me. Uh, what was his name? Pincher. <laughs> Pincher. <laughs> and you remember the frogs? Oh, yes. Catching frogs. They could see me, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we must catch it. He must have eaten strawberries. <laughs> I'll chase him towards you. <laughs> <laughs> What about that brother of yours? I saw him in Ely. I've forgotten his name. Peter. I write to him about the garden and playing with you out there. He loves to hear about it. He wishes he could be there too. You must bring him to visit me one day. Will you do that? Yes, thank you. When I get home, I'll be able to tell him the secret of the garden and take him an invitation from Hattie. <laughs> That means it's noon. I don't want to go, but I ought to. I'm to be driven home after lunch. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Bartholomew. Uh, Tom, I was just coming to fetch you. Goodbye, Mrs. Bartholomew. Thank you for the cake. I look forward to our meeting again. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> And Cousin James says I must do other things besides falling out of trees in the future. Things without me? Oh no, Tom. Whenever you want to come, so you shall. Tom will be settled in at home by now. Mm. The flat seems surprisingly empty. You know, Alan, I watched him saying goodbye to Mrs. Bartholomew. Of course, she's such a shrunken little old woman. She's hardly bigger than Tom, anyway, but... You know, he put his arms right round her and hugged her goodbye. Just as if she were a little girl. In Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, the cast was Tom, Peter England... Mrs. Bartholomew, Rachel Kempson, Aunt Gwen, Eunice Stubbs, 
Uncle Alan, Crawford Logan, Older Hattie, Deborah Berlin, Young Hattie, Sarah Morton, Abel, Callum McPherson, Aunt Grace, Judy Parkin, James, Tim Godwin, Verger, David Holt, Barty, Simon J. Williamson, Baby Hattie, Ruby Isla Seramal, Peter, George Miller, Edgar, Robert Thomas, and Hubert, Oliver Grigg. Music was by Elizabeth Parker and Tom's Midnight Garden was directed by John Taylor. <laughs>